just 30 miles south of Wilmington, North Carolina, is the historic seaside community of Southport. Originally founded in 1792 at the mouth of the Cape Fear River, the town began as a small community of river pilots who made a living guiding cargo ships through the dangerous shoals. Initially, Southport was named Smithville in honor of North Carolina politician Benjamin Smith, who served as a colonel under George Washington during the Revolutionary War and later became the 16th governor of the state. Over the following years, Smithville grew from the hundred half-acre lots drawn out by Smith and Joshua Potts into a small maritime community that also attracted wealthy families to vacation during the summer months in the town's salubrious climate and exquisite landscape. Naturally, like many early coastal cities, legends of men lost at sea are plentiful here. But this quaint fishing village turned tourist destination boasts a particularly unique piece of local lore. One that claims the beautiful seaside building that sits where Benjamin Smith's summer home once stood is haunted by the spirit of a young harpist. A harpist who came to Southport in search of work more than a century ago, but whose spirit purportedly remains to this very day. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. beautiful two-story home, once known as the Hotel Brunswick, has sat overlooking the Cape Fear River for nearly two centuries. Now located in the historic district of Southport, North Carolina, the seaside property it sits upon was first developed in the early 1800s to serve as the summer home for one of the town's founders and soon to be North Carolina governor, Benjamin Smith. He then sold the property to yet another governor, Edward B. Dudley, who also used it as a summer retreat. But in 1859, Mr. Mears tore down the old house that Smith built and began construction on the building that still stands today. The design of the home is a somewhat modified Federalist style which was popular in early American construction. But this particular example adds elements more commonly seen in Southern homes to the recognizably flat and symmetrical exterior of the Federalist style. In addition, instead of featuring a brick facade stereotypical to this type of architecture, this seaside home is covered in white clapboard siding and features a large porch that runs along the front exterior of the building. Also unique is the inclusion of a rotunda under which a chandelier is hung. And unsurprisingly, the two-story building is raised off of the ground in anticipation of the many dangers of coastal living. Then, several years after the construction, Local physician, Dr. William G. Curtis, purchased the property. Curtis arrived in Smithville in 1847 to apprentice with Dr. Sterling Everett after a year of study at Harvard. But rather than opening a traditional practice, Curtis instead oversaw the operation of the federal quarantine station 
which inspected all incoming ships and crews for the prevention of introducing infectious diseases to local ports. But as the community began receiving more and more tourists and the river's traffic increased, Dr. Curtis saw financial opportunity and turned he and his family's new home into the Hotel Brunswick. Yet Dr. Curtis did more than renovate the property. He also expanded the structure to cover much of the block and increase the amount of rooms available for rent. And after this, only one feature from the original home was left, the building's basement. This basement, like other early homes in the area, was deep and constructed with ballast stones once used on cargo ships. At one point, the basement operated as a tavern, with entryways opening on either end of the property's large front porch. Local lore has also suggested the presence of old tunnels running beneath the house, with claims that they were once used by pirates when they pillaged along the North Carolina coast. Then, after its opening, the Hotel Brunswick quickly established itself as a popular location for merchants and summer tourists. Long-term guests were also common, with room rates as low as $5 a month. And in addition to their accommodations, visitors to the hotel were treated to nightly dances held in the ballroom, often followed by moonlight cruises. It was during this time that a young Italian harpist from New York named Antonio Casaletta came to town and was hired by Dr. Curtis to provide entertainment at his establishment. Unfortunately, Tony's employment at the Hotel Brunswick did not last long, although according to local legend, his spirit has never left. Antonio Tony Casaletta was born in 1863, the youngest child of Antonio and Maria Casaletta. At some point before Tony turned seven, the family emigrated from their home in Italy and traveled to New York, where his father made a living as a painter. By the time Tony reached his teenage years, legend claims that the young man had become a virtuosic harpist so sometime around 1882, he and several other musicians decided to leave New York in search of work in the South. Traveling by steamer, the musicians eventually ended up in Wilmington, North Carolina. Unfortunately, either due to the lack of opportunities to earn as a musician or possibly even discrimination over the men's Italian heritage. They were unable to find the gigs that they had hoped for. But then, just before they reached the peak of frustration and decided to give up hope, Captain John Harper of the Steamboat Passport took the young harpist under his wing and assisted Tony and his friends in securing a regular gig at the Hotel Brunswick in nearby Smithville. In no time at all, the musician's popularity grew, but tragedy was right around the corner. On August 23, 1882, Antonio Casaletta went sailing on the Cape Fear River with his friend Ben Murray, an African-American waiter of the Hotel Brunswick, and Captain A. Garrison, a former steamer commander turned merchant in Fayetteville. 
Unfortunately, as their ship neared the shore to complete their journey, it capsized for some unknown reason, and both Tony and Ben Murray drowned. Their bodies were missing for days, but Captain Garrison survived after a difficult rescue. Two days later, on August 25th, 1882, the Wilmington Star reported on the incident. The only cause assigned for the accident is given by Captain Garrison, who says there was some deficiency in the arrangements for letting go the sheets. And when the boat capsized, the heavy iron ballast immediately sunk her. A dispatch received through the signal office last night states that the body of Tony Casaletta rose to the surface near the wharf of the steamer Blanche yesterday afternoon and was at once seen and secured. Following his death, Antonio Casaletta was buried in the old Smithville Cemetery, the same burial ground where Governor Benjamin Smith was interred. Tragically, Casaletta was only 19 when he died, and he was survived by his wife and infant child. Of course, according to local lore, Tony's love for the harp continued on well after his death, and while his body may have been interred in Southport's oldest cemetery, many believe that his spirit has lived on in the building once known as the Hotel Brunswick. Legend says that the night of Tony's death, his fellow musicians decided that the show must go on without him. But to honor their lost friend and bandmate, they left his harp on stage with them as they performed. Eerily, as they began their set, the sound of Tony's beloved instrument began to accompany them, as if the man himself were there, not ready to let go. Terence Zepke, author of Ghosts of the Carolina Coast, wrote, In memory of their friend, they set up his harp between their chairs. The unmanned harp emitted music as if it were being played. Since that time, former guests at Brunswick say that they have heard the soft sound of a stringed instrument, possibly a harp. Other variations of this legend claim that this performance was canceled out of respect for Tony and his family. However, later that night, guests were awakened from their slumber by the disembodied sounds of the harp. But then, when they rose the next morning, the guests discovered that every string of Tony's instrument had been broken. The Hotel Brunswick continued to operate in Southport for several decades after Casaletta's death. Then, in 1949, the building was purchased by Eldridge and Sarah Arrington, who used it as a private residence. But according to their daughter, Mary Stewart Kalari, who continued to own the home until 1997, stories of Tony's presence in the building were told long before her family arrived.
Brooks Newton Priok, a lifelong resident of the area, interviewed Kalari for a 1995 book, Haunted Wilmington and the Cape Fear Coast. In it, Kalari claims that her mother regularly heard Tony's music, as well as his footsteps on the beautiful, circular stairway of the home, describing the phantom music as, quote, melodic in a strange way. It sounds like a tone, though nothing you could hum. It always sounds off in the distance. But Miss Stuart Kalari had her own experiences as well, noting that Tony made his presence known in more ways than the disembodied sounds of his harp. Mother was very sick in the last months before she died and often required attention during the night. Sometimes she would cry loudly, waking everyone up. At the same time, the Disney movie Spies was being filmed in the house and there was mass confusion most of the time. Early one morning, about 1.15, I was awakened by a loud crash that sounded like someone had turned over the china closet, dishes breaking and glasses, an unmistakable sound. My husband and I were asleep at opposite ends of the house, but we both heard it. Upon further investigation, the couples found nothing out of place. But eerily, the following night, the same event took place once again, at exactly the same time. Mrs. Kalari claims this is only one of the many experiences she's had with Tony in the home, who is eventually considered the family ghost. Then, in 1997, Jim and Judy Clary purchased the historic property, renovating the beautiful federal-style building once again, before turning it into a bed and breakfast in 2009. The building that once served as the Hotel Brunswick was now the Brunswick Inn, offering rooms for rent that featured beautiful Victorian furniture and exquisite views of the Cape Fear River, as well as Bald Head Island and the Oak Island Lighthouse. Just like the previous owners had before them, the new innkeepers claim their own fair share of experiences with the ghost of Antonio Casaletta. Jim Clary has described the spirit, who they lovingly call Tony, as a quote, prankster. He enjoys moving objects and messing with the visitors. Judy Clary had her own experiences as well, and was even quoted in Southport Magazine discussing the friendly haunting. Everybody likes Tony. No one has ever seen him. At night, you will hear him walk four steps on the carpet in the rotunda, or he'll walk down the stairs. Jim and Judy Clary owned the home for over two decades. But in October of 2019, they sold the beautiful estate to a private buyer, leaving the future of the old Hotel Brunswick in question. Today, tourism is the backbone of Brunswick County's economy, and while Southport no longer serves as the county seat, the city has retained its unique historic charm, attracting numerous filmmakers who've made Southport the backdrop to such a wide-ranging group of movies as Firestarter, Weekend at Bernie's, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and A Walk to Remember. The old Brunswick Inn itself was even featured in several movies, but while the building's future is unknown, one thing is for sure. The story of Antonio Casaletta and his virtuosic phantom harp will be told in Southport for generations to come. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic.
Lucky Little Shack.